All right, so our dialysis is done. It went overnight, and then I uh, exchanged the spent buffer, which is going to be kind of a mix of tr both the tris and the sodium phosphate that the protein solution was originally in. So I switched out the buffer. I let it go again overnight. So what is inside that bag, we can be reasonably certain, is mostly going to be 50 millimolar tris with not a whole lot of sodium phosphate left. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to collect what is in the dialysis tubing. So I'm going to undo my little low budget rig here. All right. And I'm just going to collect this in a 15 milliliter conical tube so that we have it. And we're of course gonna keep that on ice. Okay, and then the tricky part, making sure that I don't lose any of this. So the problem is the part of the tubing that was not immersed in the water has totally dried out, so I'm hoping I'll be able to access what is actually in the tubing here. So I think I should be able to, it might be a little tricky. I'm probably gonna have to use some scissors to cut into this. Give me just a second here. All right, so this is gonna be tricky. Just going to take these scissors and cut the side over here. There we go. Now I'm going to stick my pipette in here if I can. Again, dexterity is an issue because I don't have a whole lot of dexterity. There we go. There we go. That's the ticket. That's the ticket. All right. So we got all that. I've got a tube here on ice. And now we have got our dialyzed fractions here and we should be just about ready to go for our ion exchange chromatography. So join us for the next part of the video and we will go ahead and start doing that. All right, so what we are doing here before we can actually start loading our sample is we need to equilibrate the column. Certainly we've already had discussions about the importance of pH on electrical charge. Well, for our DEAE resin here, at, P at pH values that are less than its pKa of I think about 11 or 11 and a half, it's gonna be positively charged. So we wanna be working at a pH that is at least two pH units away. That's how we landed on a pH of eight. So at a pH of eight, tyrosinase is gonna be negatively charged and strongly so, and the DEAE is going to be positively charged. So the two should interact. So uh, right now what we're doing is we're just letting some of the uh, uh, previous buffer run through. It's going a little bit slowly here, so I'm not going to make you sit here and watch all of this buffer run through, but just to kind of explain what I'm going to be doing here once this buffer runs through, I'm going to run a few columns worth of our 50 millimolar tris at pH 8 buffer through just to get the resin nice and equilibrated, and then the video will rejoin again once everything is all equilibrated and we are ready to load our sample. All right, so I am just about done uh, equilibrating the column here. You can see that uh, the tris buffer is right above the level of the resin. Uh, so we're just about ready to start loading our sample onto the column. So j before we get there, I just kind of want to show you everything that I have all ready to go here because this is the sort of experiment where you absolutely want to make sure that you have everything ready to go. You don't want to be scrambling to get something put together at the last minute. So on a bucket of ice over here, I have got our sample that we're gonna run through. It's probably a lot of sample to try to run through. This is probably gonna take a little bit of time, but that is okay. Uh, I have got a test tube here for flow through. So once we actually add our sample to the column, of course the idea is that tyrosinase is going to get stuck to the DEAE resin. Everything else is going to flow through, so we're going to want to collect that flow through so that we can test it for both uh, protein content and tyrosinase activity. The idea there is that there should be a decent amount of protein in the flow through, but not very much tyrosinase at all if everything goes according to plan. The specific activity of the flow through should be extremely, extremely low. And that's the way we expect it because tyrosinase should still be stuck to the column and all of the neutral and positively charged protein should flow through. 
In addition to that, once we have our Tyros nice stuck to the column, I have also got our elution buffers here. I started with a solution of one molar sodium chloride. I didn't actually show you the calculations that went into that, but it's an easy one to make. There's no pH adjustment needed. And then I started making serial dilution. So I've got the lowest concentration here, which is 1 20th the concentration of the one molar, 1 10th the concentration, 1 5th the concentration, and so on. So we also have 0.3 and 0.5. So these, as I knock the column off, uh, so these are going to be our elution buffers. The way that we are going to, once we have tyrosinase bound to the column, once we, the way that we're going to knock it off the column is we are going to add salt solutions. Now, normally, if we had a gradient maker, we would be able to do this nice and smoothly. We would constantly be flowing in buffer to the top of the column that is linearly increasing in concentration. This is a much more rough and unrefined way of doing it, but I think we'll find that it's still going to be effective. All right, so we are almost ready. So uh, the video will cut back in once the buffer has actually fallen down to the level of the resin. And at that point, we will go ahead and add our sample. So we are officially ready to start adding our sample. Like I said, this is kind of a lot of sample to be adding for this amount of column. Honestly, the amount of sample is probably equal to the amount of column in terms of volume, which isn't really the way that you want to do it. You usually want your column to greatly outnumber the amount of sample in terms of uh, volume, but we'll go ahead and see how this works. Now, something that I'm going to be interested to see here, I haven't actually uh, looked into this because I want it to be kind of a surprise for myself. I have heard tell that the melanin in here, which is responsible for the brown color, gets removed by ion exchange chromatography. So I'm going to be interested to see if we can separate the melanin away from the tyrosinase. Now, the other thing that we need to be very careful of here that I know you are aware of is that when I am adding this to the resin, I am going to want to work my pipette all around the top here so that I do not disturb the resin. I kind of ran into that problem when I was adding the Tris buffer to equilibrate it. So let's see if I can avoid that here. Let's go ahead and start doing this. So I'm just gonna add this one milliliter at a time and I'm gonna be ever so careful here. There we go. All right, and then you'll notice that I've already set up this test tube down here. Uh, it's gonna be just collecting a Tris buffer for a little while before uh, the sample actually has a chance to flow through. So I'm gonna let the sample flow through and then I'll just keep adding more and more of it until we run out of it. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, cut the video out for now, but we'll check in periodically to see how this is going. All right, so we have run into a little issue here. So you can see, as I put the camera up here, I have loaded in all of our sample and nothing is coming out the bottom. So something has happened that has caused an obstruction and the liquid can no longer flow through. And I suspect it has something to do with kind of that dark, dark band that you see right there. Remember how I said that melanin uh, is probably gonna get separated out here? Here's what I suspect. I think there's so much melanin in this sample, it has all bound to the resin right at the top and it is preventing anything else from flowing through. That's what I suspect anyway. I don't know that for sure, but that seems like a likely explanation. So this causes kind of a problem for us. If the top of the column is always gonna get obstructed by melanin, how do we proceed? Well, here is my idea. This is a little bit unconventional, but sometimes working in laboratory science requires a little bit of creative thinking. Here's what we're gonna do. I have a conical tube here. I am going to empty out both the sample and the resin, and I am going to have them all together in this tube so that the sample can freely interact with the resin. And I'm gonna have that uh, rotating overnight at four degrees. So we can give uh, the tyrosinase plenty of time to bind to the column. And then tomorrow when I come in, I am going to try this again. I'm gonna take uh, 
the resin and I'm gonna put it back into the column and then see if maybe things will work a little bit better there. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Give me just a second and I will go get uh, a, 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 a pipette. So I have no idea if this is going to work, but what we're doing right now is not working. We know that for sure. So things can't really get much worse at this point. So I've got my tube here. I'm going to pull out the sample that is in there. And here's what I'm going to do. Usually you want to avoid this, but I'm going to intentionally disrupt the resin. Yeah, I can see a whole bunch of gunk down there at the bottom. I think it's extremely likely that that is all melanin there. So I'm going, so yeah, you can see that we've kind of restored flow there. So that is something that is definitely to be avoided. So now we are definitely forcing things through. And it just occurred to me that I should probably uh, stop this down here so that we don't lose anything from the column. Okay, there we go. Now I can continue on with this. Add some of that back in there so we can keep collecting it. Yeah, so based on what I was seeing there, I'm not sure how well you all were able to see it, but uh, when I first disrupted the bottom of the, uh, kind of the top of the resin, I saw a whole bunch of very dark kind of particulate stuff. So I think it's extremely likely that that's all melanin that was getting stuck on the top of the resin and it was preventing anything else from flowing through. As soon as I disrupted that, everything kind of started flowing through the bottom again. So clearly that was kind of a problem. Okay, so I'm gonna do what I said. I've got both the sample plus all of the resin in here. I think we can actually get away with doing this because all we really care about is giving the tyrosinase plenty of opportunity to bind to the resin. So I'm just gonna have this kind of shifting around like this in the, cold, in the uh, refrigerator overnight. And then when I come tomorrow, I'll put everything back in the column here and hopefully that will give uh, the tyrosinase a free opportunity to flow down to the bottom of the column. So that's all we're going to do for today. We'll see if that ends up working. I'm optimistic that should work. I can't see any reason why it won't work, but we'll see how that goes. So that's going to be all for today. All right, so welcome back. Uh, it's been, I think, about five days since uh, we kind of ran into the issue of uh, the melanin in the mushroom extract uh, clogging up the top of our ion exchange column. So just to kind of remind you what our workaround was, I basically took all of the resin out of the column and I forcibly mixed it together with the extract to make sure that we don't run into that issue with the melanin. And what I've done since then is I've actually had this uh, 50 milliliter conical tube with both the resin and the extract mixed together. I've had it just kind of rocking back and forth in, at four degrees for the last five days. So at this point, uh, we should be pretty confident that any tyrosinase and any other negatively charged proteins are good and bound to the column at this point. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to load this back onto a new column so that hopefully we can start collecting our fractions here. So want to make sure that we get this mixed up really well. Don't want to run into any obstruction issues again. And now we are just going to load this onto the column here. Let it flow on down in there. Alright. Now what we want to do is we want to go ahead and start letting any liquid flow through here. So I'm gonna try to carefully position this here. Probably be helpful if I lower this a little bit so I can aim 
the flow through into one of these collection tubes here. All right, now I'm gonna let the valve go here. It's kind of a tight valve. There we go. All right, we've got some liquid coming through now. It's coming slowly, but it is coming. You can see it starting to come now. And there we go. So now we've actually got a pretty uh, steady stream of drops coming through. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut the video here and uh, you will rejoin us once we have actually let uh, most of this flow through and then we'll talk about uh, maybe starting our salt gradients for actually collecting our fractions. All right, so it might be a little too early to celebrate, but it seems to me like this whole workaround we came up with has worked better than I possibly could have hoped for. So you can actually see that the resin has settled itself back into the column and we actually ended up collecting a fairly impressive amount of flow through here. The fact that the flow through is a little off color suggests to me that there's probably some protein in here. So uh, just as kind of reminder, what we're hoping for here is that any protein that is in the flow through is not going to be tyrosinase. So already, assuming that the tyrosinase is here on the column, already we've achieved quite a lot of purification, assuming that that all works out the way that I said. Okay, so now as far as what to do with what is left on the column. I uh, just set the flow through into my ice bucket here so we can test it for uh, protein content and enzyme activity a little later on. Uh, we need to figure out what to do next with the column. So next step is going to be eluding the protein. And we have already settled that for ion exchange chromatography, the, be the best uh, method of elution is to apply a gradient of salt solution. So just to kind of remind you what we're dealing with here, I'll bring the camera over here. I have already made up some dilutions of sodium chloride uh, going as low as 0.05 molar sodium chloride and as high as 0.5 molar. And then finally, I actually have, if we need it, I have a one molar solution of sodium chloride. What I'm gonna do here is I'm going to apply a small volume of each of these, starting with the least concentrated, collect some fractions, and then we will test those fractions as we go along. Uh, empirically speaking, we're not really sure which one of those uh, elution buffers is going to be what it takes to get tyrosinase off of the column, but that's kind of the fun of actually doing this experiment so that we can hopefully figure out whether tyrosinase is weakly bound to the column. If that's the case, then the lower concentrated salt solutions will strip it off. If it's strongly bound to the column, it's going to maybe take one molar sodium chloride in order to get it off. So we'll just have to kind of see how it goes here. So I have got a, a test tube rack with a whole bunch of tubes in it so I am ready to start collecting fractions so by the time the video jumps up again you will hopefully see all the fractions I have collected so I'm going to uh, according to my write-up I'm going to add one milliliter of each of those elution buffers collect several fractions of each maybe two or three or four fractions each and then I will move on to the next concentration of sodium chloride up. So we'll see how it goes. All right, so I have just run the 0.05 molar sodium chloride solution through the column, and I ended up collecting four fractions that are roughly equivalent to each other. I collected three drops per tube, so uh, that covered the one milliliter plus a little bit of extra void volume from what was in the column before, so that's okay. Uh, so just so you can kind of see how this goes, I am now going to go ahead and load up the 0.1 molar sodium chloride. This is twice as concentrated as what we put through before, so anything that is still stuck to the column that didn't uh, uh, fall into those first four fractions that I collected. Well, this is a little bit stronger. It might knock some more stuff off the column this time. So first thing that I want to do here is I want to go ahead and position this so that I am actually collecting drops into tubes. And it's worth mentioning that uh, the first four fractions that I collected are already in here. A little hard to see. You can, see, yeah, you can see some of them there. I have them labeled as 0 0.05 molar fractions one, two, three, and four. There's the fourth one right there. 
So I'm just gonna go ahead and do the exact same thing here. And I do think it is worth mentioning before I go ahead and load this on, the resin kind of has a dark color to it, which I think is further evidence that the melanin is negatively charged and is sticking to the column. So I think everything that we've seen so far supports that. Okay, so I've got my P1000 micropipette set for 1000 microliters. So we're gonna go ahead and load this up here and we will start collecting fractions. So I'm just gonna be as gentle as I possibly can be so I don't dis disturb the res and I'm just kind of going back and forth in a circular motion. There we go. And now you can see the drops are starting to come and I'm going to count off one, two, three drops and then move on to the next tube. And while the next tube is collecting, I'll go ahead and label the first tube so I can make sure I keep track of everything here. There goes the first drop, that's one. Get a little bit closer in here for you. Here comes the second one. Okay, there goes number two. I'm gonna collect one more drop and then I will move the test tube rack over so I can collect the next fraction in the next tube and I'll just keep doing that. I'm not gonna make you watch a video of me doing this for all of my uh, increasing concentrated dilutions of sodium chloride. I just wanted you to see this at least once. All right, here comes the third drop. Okay, I'll go ahead and move this over. So I'm collecting in a new tube now. And now I'm going to carefully pull this tube out and you can see what I've collected in there. So I'm going to go ahead and label this while new drops are falling into that tube. So I wanna make sure I don't miss this first drop. All right, that's one drop so far. So I'm gonna label this as 0 0.1 molar fraction one. And now I'm gonna stick it in my ice bucket because we're dealing with proteins and we always want proteins to be stored at cold temperatures, of course. All right, here comes the second drop. There it goes. I'm gonna collect one more drop out of that tube and then I will move on to the next tube. All right, so at this point, I think you get the idea of how this is going. I'm just gonna keep doing this for all of my dilutions of sodium chloride. And then uh, if my math is correct here, let's go ahead and figure this out. Here comes the third droplet. So once that happens, I'll continue my uh, train of thought here. All right, so move that over, start collecting in a new tube. Uh, so I'll go ahead and label this. So if my math is correct and I'm collecting four uh, fractions for each dilution, that is going to end up being, let me go ahead and finish labeling this here. There's fraction two. That is going to end up being, let's see, four for 0.05 and then four for 0.1, another four for 0.2, that's 12, 16, 20. Uh, at maximum, I'm gonna be collecting 24 fractions if I go up as far as 1.0 molar sodium chloride. So that'll be 24 fractions that I will need to do Bradford assays on and, bo and uh, also tyrosinase assays on. So it's a good thing that we have our 96 well played format, that'll make that go a lot quicker. I'm not sure if I'll be testing that today, and if I'm not testing that today, which I don't think I will be, uh, I'll stick these fractions in the fridge so that we can just pull them out and do it either tomorrow or Thursday. So I've got one more tube to collect there. I'll go ahead and label this third one, 0 0.1 molar fraction three. Was that already a drop? Yes, it was. So I'll go ahead and collect what's left there. Stick that on ice. Well, you, I think, get how this is going. So we'll go ahead and cut the video here. And then uh, depending on whether I do the Bradford or the Tyrosinase today, uh, the video may rejoin then. So see you later. All right, so as you can see here, I have collected the 24 fractions that I said I was going to for each for my uh, six different dilutions, 0.05 molar, 0.1 molar, 0.2 molar, 0.3 molar, 0.5 molar, and then finally, just to be safe, we went ahead and did 0.1 molar as well. Right now on the column, I have added some extra 1.0 molar sodium chloride just to try to chase some of that uh, melanin off of the column. And judging by kind of the brown color of what I'm collecting in this waste beaker, you can kind of tell that we're being successful so far. Hopefully I can get some of that melanin kicked off. 
But what I'm going to go ahead and do here uh, before I run out of the lab for the day is I'm going to go ahead and do my tyrosinase assay. So I've got a 96 well plate here. And basically what I'm going to do, I'm going to make this as simple as possible. I've already made a 4 mg per mil solution of L-DOPA. That's our substrate. Uh, I am going to do this as simply as possible as the 96 well plate is set up here. A1 is going to be my blank. B1, B2, B3, and B4 are going to be the four fractions that I got for the 0 .05. And then I'm just going to keep moving down into row C, D, E, F, G as appropriate for the other dilutions. It'll make interpretation very, very, very easily. So you guys know by now how to do this. I'm going to uh, add 10 microliter of each fraction to the appropriate uh, well. For the blank, I'm just going to add 10 microliters of the 50 millimolar Tris pH 8 solution since uh, that's our negative control. And then I'll add 10 microliters of the fractions to the tube and then I'm going to add 200 microliters of the L-dope on top of that. Let it go for a few minutes then we'll throw it in the plate reader and read the absorbance of each well at 475 nanometers, which is the maximum absorption for uh, the tyrosinase product, dopachrome. So uh, we'll have one more video for the day after that's been done, and then we'll decide where to go from there. All right, so I have done the tyrosinase assay, and it actually worked pretty well. Uh, so just to kind of remind you of how we set this up, I'm trying to kind of angle this so you can see which uh, wells are actually showing some of the orange color, which indicates that there's tyrosinase present. Uh, the top wells up here, A1, which is the top left, that is our blank, our negative control. Uh, A2 and A3, I decided to go ahead and use. A2 is the uh, flow through that initially made it through the column before we added any of our Lucian buffer. Uh, it, there's not a whole lot of orange color showing up there. Uh, when I put it through the plate reader, it did read a little bit of tyrosinase activity, but not a whole lot. Uh, and then A3 is uh, basically, uh, if we kind of move over here, that kind of melanine -y, melanin-y stuff that I've been trying to knock off the uh, column. I went ahead and added some of that to A3 just to make sure that we're not losing any tyrosinase uh, after the elution, and thankfully we did not. There was no tyrosinase activity present in that stuff, so that's good. And then as you look down here, uh, B, B1, 2, 3, and 4, those are the 0 0.05 molar fractions then 0.1 molar, then 0.2 molar, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and then finally 1.0. And based on what I'm looking at, you, uh, it may be a little hard to see from your end uh, on the other side of a computer screen, but my impression is that tyrosinase first starts to get knocked off with 0.3 molar sodium chloride. 0.5 molar seems to knock off the most of it. You can see that the well that's showing the most orange color is the first fraction of the 0.5. And then we knock off a little bit more with the one molar, but it definitely does seem that we have uh, purified our uh, tyrosinase enzyme a little bit, but we can't say that for sure until next time, which we are going to do a Bradford assay to see which of these wells have total protein in it. It's important to realize that this is an assay for just one very specific protein. There are lots of proteins in the different fractions. Our goal all along has been to purify tyrosinase such that we get a fraction that has a lot of specific activity, meaning a lot of tyrosinase activity for not much total protein. So we'll see which of these fractions have protein in them. It would be a little bit disappointing to see all the protein concentrated in the same fractions that have tyrosinase. I think it would be a lot more satisfying to see a whole bunch of protein in the first few fractions, not as much in the later fractions. That would indicate that we get a lot of purification happening. Okay, so that is all I'm going to do for today. Uh, next time, I will go ahead and do the Bradford assay, and then from there, we should be able to infer a lot about the relative specific activity of each of these fractions, and we'll know which ones to keep and which ones to pitch in the garbage. Well, thank you for your attention, and I will see you next time.